Carlos. <laughs> VOA won the hits. Welcome to Learning English, a daily 30-minute program from the Voice of America. I'm Jonathan Evans. And I'm Ashley Thompson. This program is aimed at English learners, so we speak a little slower and we use words and phrases especially written for people learning English. Today on the program, you will hear from Dorothy Gundy, Alice Bryant, Dan Friedel, and Jill Robbins. Later, Katie Weaver and Ashley will bring us the next part in our series on America's National Parks. But first, here is Dorothy Gundy. Tim Putnam operates a small hospital in rural Indiana. In March 2020, the 25-bed facility got hit very hard by COVID-19. We had more cases per capita in our region than, I believe, anywhere, said Putnam, head of Margaret Mary Health. We were equal to New York City. At the worst point of the pandemic, Putnam's employees were caring for 40 patients. One of the hospital's biggest struggles was trying to effectively treat a flood of long-term patients. Many local community members came forward to do what they could to help. Some donated or made face coverings for health care workers. A local dealer of recreational vehicles offered to provide free use of the vehicles for treating patients or as a place for workers to sleep. Several hospital employees at Margaret Mary Health got sick, but all of them recovered. Hospitals across the United States have faced similar problems during the pandemic. Before the crisis, they had not thought much about how to quickly adapt during a health care emergency. Today, many American hospitals remain more centered on services for outpatients, people who come to the hospital for treatment but do not need to stay overnight. Putnam said 83% of his hospital's money comes from outpatient work. As a result, he said a lot of the hospital's inpatient areas were unused before the COVID-19 health crisis. The pandemic has forced many hospitals to rethink how to keep their communities safe and healthy. Putnam has spoken to hospital design experts to better prepare his hospital for the next disaster. Jim Albert designs health care centers for a living. He says most hospitals were not designed to serve a large increase in patients. But that is starting to change, with designers working to create more adaptable spaces. For example, putting more power outlets on a wall or increasing pipe sizes could support more machines to assist breathing. Albert said effective planning can save money and permit far greater flexibility in how spaces are used. Could we put two patients in every room in a true emergency if we had to? Putnam is seeking a hospital design that can adapt to changing needs in different emergency situations that could arise. The design cannot be a static design, he said. As an example, Putnam said that during a crisis, the physical therapy center might need to become an operating room. Administrative offices may need to turn into space for patient care. That kind of adaptability needs to be built into the building's design, he added. 
Another much bigger concern for hospitals after COVID-19 is preventing the spread of infection. This could greatly change the way public spaces in hospitals, like waiting rooms, are designed. For example, patients could be asked to wait in their vehicles outside the building until they can be seen, or a whole area of the emergency department might be created to only treat infectious patients. Spaces for hospital employees might also change. Fewer people could share workspaces, and there could be fewer break rooms. Non-medical workers could be moved out of the hospital to work from home, Albert said. Another concern is ventilation. In most hospitals. Only about one third of the air is brought in from the outside, but one hospital Albert is currently designing would provide fully fresh air to some rooms. Hospitals are also looking for new ways to keep patients healthy, so they will not need to go to the hospital. One plan is to increase the number of online doctor visits. Putnam and other hospital officials say community hospitals need to be ready and flexible to deal with the next medical emergency, whatever that may be. That is why it will be important to design centers that can meet that need. I'm Dorothy Gundy. Thirty-six pro-democracy activists are still being held in Hong Kong jails more than a month after first appearing in court to face charges. The defendants are to remain in jail. Until their next planned court appearance on May 31st, no trial date has been set. Critics are denouncing the way the activists' cases are being handled. They see the process as the latest attempt by China to sharply limit speech and other freedoms in Hong Kong. The activists. Were arrested on charges related to a new national security law passed by the Chinese government last June. Critics say the law is meant to silence opposition in the former British territory. In total, forty-seven pro-democracy activists were brought to court March first on charges. Of conspiracy to commit subversion, eleven of them were permitted to leave jail after they were given bail. The charges were related to an unofficial primary election the activists helped organize. The process was meant to choose the best candidates to win seats in Hong Kong's. Legislative elections. Those elections were supposed to happen last September, but have been postponed until December. The situation surrounding the jailed defendants has worried many in Hong Kong. They say it is a clear example of how the national security law is making extreme changes. To the city, the law punishes what it considers unlawful acts, such as subversion, terrorism, and working with foreign forces, with up to life in prison. In one of the latest court hearings on April fourteenth, former journalist and Democratic lawmaker Claudia Mo. 
was denied bail for a second time. The hearing started at West Kowloon Magistrates Courts on March 1st. Over the next four days, the defendants had more than 40 hours of hearings. They were denied a change of clothes throughout and, at first, not permitted to shower. Ten were taken to the hospital, some suffering physical exhaustion. In the courtroom next to the hearings, some family members and supporters cried as they watched through a live video link. At least 12 of the defendants announced on social media that they would no longer be involved in politics. Some resigned from their jobs. Some removed their Facebook accounts, including four members of the pro-democracy Civic Party. In an open letter published April 16th, the four called for the party to separate. Everyone's peace and safety is what we care about deeply in our hearts, the letter said. Law experts and government critics say the long hearings are part of a plan to crush Hong Kong's democracy movement after the protests of 2019. Leaders in Beijing and Hong Kong have said the protests launched the city into a crisis and caused a serious security risk. On April 15th, Hong Kong Chief Executive Carrie Lam praised the national security law for effectively restoring stability. The defendant's situation is highly unusual in Hong Kong. An active judge and two retired judges told Reuters news agency. The city long took pride in the independence of its British-style judicial system. Now, the judges said, the long bail hearings have marked a real change from the territory's common law tradition. Simon Young is a lawyer and law professor at the University of Hong Kong. Of the defendants, he said, we can ask whether it was necessary to charge everyone at the same time and process them all together. One of the retired Hong Kong judges expressed disapproval for how the hearings are progressing and the way the defendants are being treated. Some in the territory said they agreed with the process, including the denial of bail for many of the defendants. Pro-Beijing lawmaker Holden Chow told Reuters he thinks the court has rightly handled the entire process. However, the Hong Kong Bill of Rights states that detaining defendants should not be the general rule. The exception is when there are clear risks of a defendant committing more offenses or running away. But now, whenever there is a conflict, the national security law replaces all local laws in Hong Kong. The new law means defendants could spend months detained before trials begin. One active judge told Reuters the bail hearings were a reminder of show trials used by China and other governments to mentally weaken political opponents publicly. The judge spoke on the condition that Reuters would not publish his or her name. 
Over the past year, Hong Kong officials have disqualified candidates from public office and stopped protests. And they have jailed well-known activists like Joshua Wong and media businessman Jimmy Lai. China's leaders are also now changing the city's electoral system to ensure only people it considers patriots can govern Hong Kong. The Chinese government did not answer requests from Reuters for comment. The Hong Kong Department of Justice decides who will be charged. It said in a statement to Reuters that generally, people are only charged if there is enough evidence to support a conviction and if it is in the public interest to do so, the statement noted. The document charging the 47 people says that the defendant's main aim was to force the city's chief executive to resign. Prosecutors have said the democracy movement's primary election method was a violation of the national security law. In comments to Reuters, the Hong Kong judiciary said it was examining the overall arrangements of handling cases involving a large number of litigants and observers at all levels of courts. The examination was taking place with the goal of finding improvement measures to the process, it said. I'm Dan Friedel. And I'm Alice Bryant. Across the country, schools for children of all ages are reopening. Asian American families are struggling with making a decision whether to send their children back into classrooms. Their concern is based on increasing anti-Asian behavior. A Chinese American mother in a town outside Boston is sending her sons to in-person classes this month. Earlier, Another student made a racist, slanted eyes movement with his hands to one of the boys. In the Dallas area, a Korean American family is keeping their middle school aged child in online classes for the rest of the year. They made the decision after they saw a question filled with racist Chinese stereotypes on one of her tests. Asian American students have the highest rates of at-home learning more than a year after the coronavirus pandemic closed school buildings. Earlier this month, the federal government released a report that found just 15% of Asian American 9 to 10-year-olds were attending classes in person as of February. More than half of white children that age are attending in person. Those rates appear to be rising in some cities, but are still far lower than those of black, Latino, and white students. Sacramento, Boston, and Chicago public schools, for example, expect that about 33% of Asian American students will return to in-person classes this month. In comparison, they expect some 70% of white students to return. In Quincy, a small town near Boston, Kim Horrigan said she and her husband have struggled with their decision to keep their eight-year-old son home this year. Horrigan said, she has never really considered racism a threat to her family, even though the Asian American population of the town has grown to 25%, and there are some racial problems in the community. 
she is worried about exposing her household, including her aged parents and her two young children, to COVID-19. We've taken so many precautions, she said. Why would we drop our guard now, with just a few weeks left? Anti-Asian behavior has affected many Asian American children. A September report by Stop AAPI Hate found that about 25% of Asian American children said they had experienced discrimination. That includes spoken words, social shunning, and physical attacks during the pandemic. Concerns about virus spread and rising racism are reasons for the in-person learning differences. Peter Kiang is Director of Asian American Studies at the University of Massachusetts in Boston. He says that at-home learning is often a better choice for many Asian families who live in multi-generational households. These ethnic-defined support systems have been operating for more than a year already, while parents are out working long hours, Kang said. It is important to note that many Asian Americans live in and around large cities like Boston. Schools there have just begun to reopen, said Robert Teranishi. He is a professor of education and Asian American studies at the University of California, Los Angeles. Meanwhile, in San Francisco, more than 30% of public school students are from Asian families, and there is no plan for the return of students 12 and older. Grace Hu is a 16-year-old in Sharon, Massachusetts. She has been learning at home all school year. She found it easy to decide to go back to in-person classes later this month. I'm feeling trapped at home, Hu said. I just want to see my classmates again. Meanwhile, in Needham, Massachusetts, Denise Chan said she is not concerned about placing her three young sons back in classes full-time in recent weeks, even after the slanted eyes incident. She said her son talked with his teacher about the racist comment. His teacher had the other student apologize, and she promised to talk about racism in the classroom. I'm Jill Robbins. And I'm Katie Weaver. On our National Parks journey, we explore a unique place where two deserts meet. The hot, harsh, rocky landscape is home to a rare and strange-looking tree. In fact, the park gets its name from this iconic plant. Welcome to Joshua Tree National Park in southeastern California. The limbs of Joshua trees stretch and twist upward in all directions. At the end of each limb are sharply pointed green leaves. The plant looks like a large cactus and can grow over 12 meters tall. But As the National Park Service explains, Joshua trees are not really even trees. They are succulents that belong to the yucca family. Succulents are desert plants that can hold a lot of water inside them. Joshua trees are not exactly beautiful. An early explorer to the area once described them as the most repulsive tree in the vegetable kingdom. But park visitors are amazed by the wild-looking forests of Joshua trees. 
The Mormon religious group is said to have given the plant its name. Mormon settlers reportedly thought it looked like the Christian holy figure Joshua, his arms held out, guiding travelers to the promised land. Joshua trees thrive in the climate of the Mojave, one of two deserts within the park. The Mojave is a high desert. It is 900 meters above sea level. It is also relatively cool and wet. The Mojave Desert meets up here with the Colorado Desert. The Colorado is a lower desert. It makes up the eastern part of the National Park. Much of the park sits within the overlap of the two deserts. The overlap creates a diverse ecosystem where many plants and animals thrive. Within the park, you can find bighorn sheep, desert tortoises, iguanas, and black-tailed jackrabbits. The park is also home to 250 kinds of birds, like the red-tailed hawk, the roadrunner, and the Scots oriole. After spring rainstorms, desert wildflowers burst to life in colorful display. The blooms on Joshua trees are bright white. Cacti produce bright purple, red, and orange wildflowers. The blooms last just a few weeks before the hot summer heat becomes too strong. Along with Joshua trees, large piles of rocks are another defining part of the park's landscape. The huge boulders sit stacked on top of each other. Roads and hiking trails lead visitors through paths of these boulders. Joshua Tree National Park is over 320,000 hectares. It has many hiking and walking trails, from long hikes that take all day to finish to short ones, like the Hidden Valley Trail. This trail takes you through an area that was once a place for cattle-stealing cowboys to hide out. The area's massive rock piles made for effective places to hide in the desert. These huge boulder piles and rock walls have made Joshua Tree National Park world famous for rock climbing and bouldering. The park has more than 8,000 climbing routes. John Hockhausler often comes to Joshua Tree to rock climb and enjoy nature. He makes the three-hour drive from Los Angeles, where he is a lawyer. When you see the park from down low, it's beautiful, but when you see the park from 150, 200 feet up, it's amazing. Renat Ehrlich visited the National Park with Hockhausler. She is also a lawyer in Los Angeles. She had just tried rock climbing at Joshua Tree for the first time. We love it. We uh, come here to uh, walk on trails. Uh, last time we were here, we rode Jeeps, which was so much fun. And it's just a great place, great outdoorsy place with a lot of character. I'm Katie Weaver. And that's our program for today. Listen again tomorrow to learn English through stories from around the world. I'm Jonathan Evans. And I'm Ashley Thompson.